Okay, Welty Baby Grand. Partially rebuilt. Oversized pins into the original pin block. Uh, the pins are quite tall. Beckets aren't well seated. Coils are not tight. But anyway, what I want to show you here is where let off is. And I don't know if you get the picture, but it's way away from the string and there is no aftertouch. And the reason for this is partly uh, that the, when the key tops were put on, the tops of the keys were relieved enough so that the top of the new key top is flush to the old top of the key. I took the um, hammer rest rail out because the shanks were lying on it and I wanted to bed the keyframe. Um, the shanks were actually sitting on the little keepers for the repetition lever. Taking the spring out, I've swept and gone over by hand, and as you go through this area, the back rail has texture. Seems that something has spilled down into it. Um, also, curiously, there is a, a shim of some sort that uh, maybe, maybe it's not purposefully glued down. That's in the middle of the back rail. Uh, so perhaps I'll have a little bit of a cleanup before I begin. Okay, just as a point of reference. Okay, we had tapping at the front rail. I have backed up these two little glide bolts and pleased to say there is no tapping. Whoop, getting you in camera. No tapping. No tapping back anyway. Oh, a little bit at the other end. Okay, we'll try the same thing there. Okay, I've backed off each of the studs so that there are a couple of thousands play under them. The front rail all um, ended up fitting once that was done. And previously I cleaned off the back rail. Um, I insert long screwdriver between keys and go down through onto the back row cloth. <laughs> Sounds good. The WNG keyframe bedding tool is a dial indicator nicely designed to fit over the key pins on top of the um, buttons um, and it just fits into its housing like this and it has a, a stop screw at the top and the bottom and this started off way down here comes with a little hex wrench and that is where it needs to be Okay, and then you just turn up, turn one out of the way and turn the other into place and then pinch between the two. You can see the um, indicator moving. That is as it's touching the top of the pin block. And the pin block's not gonna move and the key bed is not gonna move, but the key frame on top of the bed can move. 
and uh, that the balance rail is designed in this case to be suspended on four glide bolts. And this treble most glide bolt has been backed up a little. As I press down on this, it moves about a thousandth of an inch. So I've got a very small amount to turn this thing. And um, it's in a, sort of an awkward place, more or less under key 88. Um, and I have found the slot, so I'm leaving it in the slot. Hopefully I haven't displaced it. Um, and I'm going to try and turn it a very small amount. Now the thing about glide bolts is they have a very coarse thread in order to not strip under the stresses of being played. Um, but that coarse thread makes it very difficult to land in exactly the right spot. But the dial indicator at least gives us information until we touch down and then we don't know how far we've gone. And um, touching a little too far isn't a problem as long as the back rail and the front rail are still in contact. A uh, thing about balance rail bedding is to have the glide bolts in balance with each other so that one isn't favored over the neighbors. That can lead to a place where under the right circumstances you have a knock out of the one that is lighter than its neighbor. When we adjust the next one, we look back at the first one to see if it now moves. Uh, on the bench, we're going to use the glide bolts to readjust the balance rail so that this, the samples that we take in the piano will be matched on the bench. Uh, a little counterintuitive because we've just set them carefully in the piano, but when we're out on the bench, of course, uh, the bench is a different shape. Maybe only slightly, but it won't be exactly the same. So we need to translate it so that uh, for a given key dip, your hammer rise is exactly the same. Okay, so we've got a little bit, it's a very small amount that I have to turn this. And there it is. You gotta be careful not to go into a tuning pin hole, obviously. Um, but we still have um, a couple of thousands there. So, let's see if I'm strong enough to do this. Here's a little bit, still a little. Still a little. Okay. So now we don't have to, you know, unless it's wrong, we don't have to re-engage that notch in the glide bolt. We just check it and it's fine. Okay, on to the third and the fourth. I wanted to show uh, a couple of other things about keyframe bedding with the uh, bedding tool. Um, this was remarkably hard to turn, so you're allowed to use mechanical advantage. I got a, a wrench of a suitable size, uh, an adjustable wrench big enough for this, the handle of my screwdriver. Now, if you watch here, as I turn it up, see the dial indicator move? Well. This was way backed up and had no symptom, but it also wasn't touching down. And if I did it increment by increment, it would have taken me a very long time. But you can just um, turn it down until it moves, until it, yeah, until it moves, and then turn it back until it doesn't move. So it's right there that it moves. Okay, that one's moving. So I can try backing this one off to see if it stops moving. Okay, right about there is where it stops. Yeah, it's got motion. There it doesn't. So now I've got to go back and check my other one. 
that I've got. It may have been the weight of the spanner that was causing this differentiation. But between the two things, you can uh, find out where you are. Yep, that was it. It was the weight of the spanner was bearing on it. And please like, subscribe, or follow the link in the notes to my website.